journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used to take the journey of a lifetime and, and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. So, we begin our program tonight with our first presentation. And our first presentation tonight is titled, Journey to Eternity, Egypt and the Phoenicians. One thing about the Egyptians that we all know is that they were obsessed with eternity. The Egyptians had this obsession with, the, with living beyond this uh, human life. And so as we look at the archaeological evidence and we look at the movies and some of us grown up fascinated with Egypt. What is it about Egypt that is so fascinating? You see, Egypt was obsessed with eternity. And so when you look at the, when you look at the history of the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, um, you'll notice that they had certain ingredients of how they would come to find eternity. And I want to share a few of those with you tonight. The first thing that the Egyptians needed for eternity was a body. And the reason why they wanted a body was that they wanted a body for the soul's return. You see, the Egyptians and the Phoenicians believed that when the body died, the spirit continued on into another realm. And so when the Egyptians uh, uh, were buried, what they would do is they made sure that they had a body. Okay, And so the Egyptians invented and they perfected the art of mummification. We all know that, don't we? Because they, in their minds, having a body was absolutely essential um, to the afterlife. Number two, when you look at the Egyptians and their history, not only did they need a body, but they also needed a tomb. A what, everybody? A tomb. And why did they need a tomb? Well, the screen says that they needed the tomb to protect the body. And so, as we all know so well, um, when you travel to Egypt, that you would see these colossal giant stone um, buildings, or what we would call the mighty pyramids. We've all been fascinated by them, haven't we? We've all grown up watching movies about them, and um, it's one of the ancient wonders of the world. And so, did you know that when you look at these uh, pyramids, uh, such as Khufu's Pyramid here in Cairo, Egypt, they are fascinating, a uh, colossal size. They, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling until you actually go there and you see just how gigantic uh, these pyramids are. In fact, they, scholars suggest that um, with these pyramids, they're somewhat over the estimation of 2.3 million of these stones. That's a lot of stones, isn't it? Quite a number of them. And so when you look at these stones, um, one person come up with this uh, amazing fact, is that if you would get a cube, 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters, and you put these 30 centimeter cubes uh, one next to each other, the, the statistics say that you could actually line them up and it will go all around the circumference of Australia twice. That's how huge these pyramids uh, stones are. And so what you'll notice, if you'll see the picture here on the screen here, right at the top there, they have the remnants of Tura limestone. And so this limestone, as you can see, the whole, the rest of the pyramid, there's no more limestone today because people have actually taken them, grave robbers and others, and they've used these Tura limestones for buildings and other such projects. But we see a bit remnants. So can you picture, imagine the whole pyramid would have been covered in this beautiful limestone. It would have been a fascinating and marvel to behold. And so just to give you an idea of just how big these, this building is, the pyramid, did you know that if the pyramids were actually hollow, in other words, there was nothing in it, right? Did you know that you could fit these buildings inside this pyramid? You could fit the Muhammad Ali Mosque in Cairo inside there. You could also fit in the Notre Dame Cathedral. Now, amazing. You could also fit, um, let's continue along, you could also fit St. Peter's Basilica in Rome in this pyramid. You could also fit St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And did you know that you could also fit the famous Colosseum in Rome? Isn't that amazing? 
that you could fit all of these buildings inside this pyramid if it was simply hollow. Just to give you an idea of how big these pyramids were. And by the way, friends, why did the Egyptians make the pyramids? Because to protect the body uh, into their safe passage into the afterlife. So when you look at the Egyptians and the Phoenicians, not only did they need a body, not only did they need a tomb, but they also needed a heart. Now, what is so important about the heart? You see, the Egyptians believed that the heart was essential in determining one's destiny as they went into the afterlife. For, for instance, for the judgment. And you'll notice this famous painting here uh, from the judgment scene from the Book of the Dead. If you can see a little bit closer, you'll notice there is a picture of a scale. And on one hand, on the left side, you'll see a little bottle with a heart in it. And on the other side here, you see the feather of truth. And so when the Egyptians and Phoenicians died, each person's heart was weighed against the feather of truth. And if the person was good, and the, the balance is weighed uh, proportionately, then they would have safe passageway into the afterlife. If not, this crocodile uh, god here would actually eat them up. And you don't want to be eaten up by the crocodile, all right? Just to give you an idea. Not only, not only did the Phoenicians believe that the heart was important, but also a, the name. And the reason behind the name is that so that when... That when they went to the afterlife, that they were able to be identified so that the soul would actually return back to the specific body that it had left. Okay? And so then that's why you, if you go to Egypt and you go to some of these tombs, you would see often on the hieroglyphics these, this imagery here of what we would call cartouches in Egypt. And basically this is what, like, kind of like in our uh, culture, like a signature. It's like a sign telling people who this person was. And so for an Egyptian, it was very important that these tombs and pyramid, these tombs had cartouches. And, and I've been there and you notice all of these different imagery to designate this is a particular person. Okay? But the last thing, when you look at the Phoenicians and the Egyptians, not only did they have the heart and the, the tomb and the body, but they also had their material possessions or their things. To enjoy the afterlife. And so when you visit the famous Cairo Museum there in Egypt, you will notice one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of this century. Uh, it was the treasures of Tutankhamun. Now Tutankhamun wasn't the most prestigious pharaoh. He wasn't the most famous. He was only somewhat 18, 19 years old. But what they discovered in Tutankhamun's tomb was quite fascinating. In fact, when you go over there to the tombs of Egypt, uh, the pyramids, up until this point, the pharaohs were buried inside these pyramids. But what happened? You see, they had people who'd come to grave rob these tombs and they would plunder all of the, the possessions of these, uh, these famous pharaohs. And so what they did was they actually stopped burying them in these pyramids and they moved them to what they called the Valley of the Kings. And so over there in the 18th dynasty, somewhat about 1500 years before Christ, they stopped burying the pharaohs in the tombs and they moved them to the Valley of the Kings here in Luxor. And so some of you may know, you've probably seen that famous movie, Cecil uh, B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. And some of you are a bit younger, you, you've seen the cartoon movie, The Prince of Egypt, right? And so the, Moses, the biblical character that we find in the Old Testament scripture, um, scholars suggest that he was living around this time, around the 18th dynasty. And this was when they transitioned from pyramid to the Valley of the Kings. And so a fascinating discovery in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 1922, uh, a man by the name of Howard Carter actually uh, discovered these tombs that were basically buried underneath these rocks. And so as they discovered Tutankhamun's tomb, it was a fascinating discovery. And by the way, this is something we all know. You know we've seen it on the news and you've seen documentaries about uh, Tutankhamun and his possessions. But I just want to run you through some of the things that they actually found. See, they found uh, over 3,000 objects. Think about that for a moment. In our day and culture, when we're married, we don't really get buried with stuff and possessions. But in the time of Pharaoh, all of their material possessions, everything they held so dear was buried with them. And so as you can see, some of the pictures here up on the screen, these are all gold artifacts. In fact, they found a lot of uh, beds 
they found these uh, gold-sized statues so that they could protect the Pharaoh uh, in the afterlife. They also found in Tutankhamun's tomb uh, royal chariots. And these are uh, fascinating archaeological discoveries. They also found he, uh, he, a throne where perhaps Tutankhamun once sat on. Isn't that amazing? This is, this is solid gold, friends. And what I also found interesting about the discoveries of Tutankhamun is that they noticed in the discovery, they found this uh, economic chest. And the idea behind this economic chest was that when they opened this economic chest, inside was this um, alabaster box. And inside this middle picture, the alabaster box, when they opened that up, they found these uh, four mini statue type figures there, as you can see on the picture. So what's important about these, um, these little statues there? Well, when, when they opened them, the four of them, they opened these uh, alabaster uh, out, outer box and they found four of these gold mini coffin like, uh, like images. And did you know what was actually inside these little mini gold coffin little objects? Well, they actually found Tutankhamun's, well, it believed it would be his, his internal organs, his liver <laughs> and his kidney. Yeah, it's quite... It's quite gruesome to think about it now, but that's what they did. They, they found his internal organs inside these, um, in these little uh, golden coffin objects. What is also fascinating about these discoveries is that they found his, the, the burial uh, tomb. And what they found here is this, this giant box. And then what happens is after they open the box, they found three smaller boxes inside. And so when they opened the, the outer box, they f and they found this uh, quartz-sized sarcophagus, which was somewhat of a tomb uh, stone, so to speak. And what they found is, if you can see the picture in there, they found a gold uh, covering, a coffin. And what the archaeologists discovered, Howard Carter and his, his friends, when they opened it, there was actually three other layers before they get to the actual body. And I hope to see some of these pictures here. Okay, so when they opened this one, there was actually three other coffins, one after the other, and the last one was actually made of pure gold. It was rather heavy and it actually two meters of somewhat of pure gold. And when they opened the final layer, what did they find? Well, they found the body of the mummified remains of Tutankhamun. Just to give you an idea of just how significant it was for the Phoenicians to be buried with their material uh, possessions. And finally, as we've seen so often in, on the internet and we've seen on documentaries, covering uh, Tutankhamun was the famous funerary mask or death mask. It was pure gold and it would have come up to about yay high, middle of your bottom of the chest and it would have been worn over his back and it would have come right over the back here. So this is what was discovered over Tutankhamun when they discovered him back in the 1920s. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? Which leads me to the question, why all this trouble? What is it about the Phoenicians that they went to such painstaking efforts to uh, be buried with material things, to be buried in a tomb? Why did they make these gigantic pyramids? And what was all the reason? Well, if you go to the biblical record, friends, there is a reason behind it. And the, the text of the Bible scriptures tell us tonight, and I think it's rather relevant for tonight's topic, is it tells us in the Old Testament scripture, book of Ecclesiastes. And by the way, if you've been coming every night, I invite you to say the yellow words with me, the highlight words, right? And so let's read it. It says, He, your God, has put eternity in their hearts. I find it fascinating that not just the Phoenicians and the Egyptians... But also every one of us this evening, there is something innately in us that does not want to die. There is something in us that wants to live forever. Do, am I right? And, and the reason being, if I could just be very frank with you, the biblical record says the reason is, is because God, the supernatural being we call God of the Bible, has put eternity into our hearts. And so... We all want to live forever. You know, you've probably heard that song, I want to be forever young. You know, you've probably heard that song. But the question is tonight, how do we live forever? Is it possible that we can live forever? 
And I want to ask the question, how can we live forever? And if I could sit down with each of you and have a bit of a one-on-one conversation, um, you would let me know and I'll let you know, yeah, I want to live forever. I don't want to die. Death is not something we think about. Am I right? We don't think about our last day on this earth and yet death is going to be the, the, common, uh, the common end for us. Uh, so to speak, on this side of eternity. So the question I'm going to raise to you tonight in our presentation is, is thinking about the Egyptians who had such a, a, a big uh, uh, goal in living forever. Um, what does the Bible actually say about this? And that's what I'll look at tonight. You see, because when we, if we were just to take the Egyptians and to, to look at their uh, way of living in the afterlife, there are a couple of problems with this. And one, one of the problems is, is the mummies are missing. And so if you're an Egyptian and you wanted to live in the afterlife and you needed a body, well, someone just went to your tomb and stole your body. So what are you going to do about that? (laughs) And another another, uh, problem, a challenge you would find is the treasures, the things for the afterlife, they're gone. So if you're an Egyptian and you're kind of creating your, your tomb with all your stuff, you're not guaranteed it's going to be with you on the other side. It's like going to the airport and you, you leave your, your luggage with the, with the attendants and you're not sure if you're going to get it on the other side. You know what I mean? And so with the Egyptian idea of the afterlife, um, some things we need to think about and consider. That they put so much effort into it and yet um, things are missing and their treasures are not with them today. So... How can we find a reliable source? And if you're here for the first time, I I just want you to know that we've been looking the last weekend over the historical accuracy of the scriptures. We've been looking at the fact that when you look at the Bible and you look at the prophecies in particular, we can see that there are proven uh, predictions that have come true. And so that's why we've been transitioning. And the bulk of our meetings here on is looking at what the biblical record is saying. Okay. And so what we've been doing over the last few nights, we've been very heavily looking at the prophecies, particularly the Old book, Testament book of Daniel. And so now we're going to be looking more at the book of Daniel, but also the book of Revelation. Um, if you're new to studying the Bible, you'll notice that the Old Testament book of Daniel and the last book of the New Testament, what we call Revelation, they're actually books that go together. And so Daniel will say something in the book of Daniel that we see repeated in Revelation. And so now we're going to see more of the the text from the last book as we continue on in our series. Okay? So when we go to the book of Revelation, you will notice that John, the apostle, and by the way, John is the author of the last book. He was one of the 12 disciples. He was the last known living disciple of of Jesus. In fact, the rest of them uh, met a martyr's death. They were killed, uh, persecuted. But John, by the divine hand of God, was allowed to see his later years in an island in Greece called Patmos. And while he was there, and it's a fascinating story if you read the opening pages of Revelation, God revealed to him certain visions of what would happen in the future. And we're going to be looking at that a lot more deeper as we continue in our programs. And so when you look at the Apostle John, he was shown visions or predictions of earth's final events. And in these messages in the book of Revelation, we we find here God's final message to mankind before the return of Jesus. And if you were here on our opening night, You will notice that we looked at the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. Hands up if you were here that opening night. Remember the statue image? And remember how we saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the divided toes, Western Europe? Well, before the rock kingdom comes, which we understand to be the kingdom of Christ, these messages go to the whole world to let people know that guess what? Christ's kingdom is coming. And I want you to notice these powerful messages. We're going to only look at the first one tonight, very briefly. And so the first angel's message tells us in the book of Revelation. Then I saw another angel. Can you help me out? What's the angel doing? He's flying in the midst of heaven. In other words, uh, uh, this message is going to the whole world. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Guess what, friends? What planet are you living on? So guess where this message is going? It's going right here in New Zealand and it's going all over this world. The text tells us to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, 
tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. You see, why is the urgency about this message that goes to the world? What is it so important about this message that you and I need to sit and really pay close attention to? Because the text tells us in the book of Revelation, these words. Can you say it with me? The hour of his judgment has come. And if you look at the, the original language there in Greek, it actually is saying it is come. And in fact, we're living in the judgment hour. And so as we looked at our opening night, when we look at that famous prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, the last empire is about to appear. My friends, that's why tonight is so important. I know that there are plenty of people out there watching the All Blacks and go the mighty All Blacks. But you know what? I think this is more important than that. Because we're talking about things that are of eternal significance. And so what we're talking about tonight is that this rock kingdom... That Jesus is going to establish, which he wants all of us to be part of, by the way, is about to appear. And so when we looked at, uh, we looked briefly at that the opening night, and the kingdom of God that he will establish is a wonderful kingdom. It's a kingdom of no tears, no pain, no sorrow, and no death. Now, I know that as we sit here tonight, that sounds almost too good to be true, William. How can we live in a place with no many tears, no more death, no more crying? Friends, that's what the Bible predicted about God's coming kingdom. And I want to be part of it. How about you? That's why we're presenting these meanings, because God wants each of us to be ready. And so eternity, when you look at the Phoenicians... The Phoenicians had their way of understanding the afterlife. My friends, the Bible tells us in these last days, God is giving a message to the whole world and you're not here by accident because God wants you to be part of that kingdom. So the question is, how can you and I be part of this last empire? Well, the answer is found back in the Bible. If we go back to the text in Revelation, I want you to, to say the highlighted word with me again. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. And tonight, my friends, we're going to be talking about this, this idea or this teaching or this thing called the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? As you can see, the gospel is, simply means good news. The good news. And so this, my friends, is what is going to the whole world Preparing people for the coming kingdom that Christ wants to establish. And so we're going to look at this tonight in detail. In fact, when you look at the biblical record, the text tells us in 2 Timothy, it says there, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought what, everybody? Light. To light. I want you to just think about what the text is saying to us. It says that through Jesus... He's abolished death and brought life and immortality. In other words, for immortality is to live forever. And the reason how we can have eternity, eternal life, is found through the gospel. That's good news tonight. Because what the text is telling us in the book of Revelation is that the gospel news of Jesus is going to go to the whole world and then people will respond to this good news and which will prepare them to receive and to be ready for the coming kingdom. That's what it's saying. In fact, number one, when we're talking about the gospel, I want you to know this. This is fascinating news tonight. It tells us this evening that the good news is for how many people? It's for all people. Isn't that good? The text tells us it's for everybody. In fact, we go back to Revelation. Listen to the words here. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what, everybody? Everlasting, Everlasting gospel. To preach to those who dwell on the earth. To where? Every, Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So my friends, this gospel is not only going to New Zealand, it's going to Australia, it's going to Africa, it's going to the Pacific Islands, it's going everywhere. Isn't that good? Because God doesn't want anybody to miss out. This message is going to the whole world. 
In fact, the text, uh, the verses continue on to tell us God loves all and he wants all to have eternity. That's why this news is so good. And tonight you're going to have an opportunity to respond to this beautiful message that God wants you to be part of his forever kingdom. In fact, I love these verses in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter was one of the followers of Jesus, one of the closest followers. Listen to what he says to us tonight. He says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish. Do you know what that means to you tonight, friends? God doesn't want you to perish. Bryn, he doesn't want you to be lost. He doesn't want William to be lost. He doesn't want you, Paula, to be lost. He wants every one of us here tonight to be ready. And I don't know about you, but that tells me that we serve an amazing God. God is a, a, a God of love. And His desire, I don't know this. I can't explain. What, I'm just simply reading what it's saying to us. I can't fathom how much God loves each of us. But yet the Bible is very clear. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. In fact, we continue on here. Love found a way to bring us eternal life. Number two, as we look at our presentation this evening, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the good news is good news because the good news is about a person. And we, we shared in our early presentation about the historical fact that Jesus actually did live. He actually existed on this earth some 2,000 years ago. But what's even more fascinating is not only he lived, but he died for a reason. And that's what we're talking about tonight. I want you to notice the text. 1 John, one of the disciples of Jesus, notice what he says to us tonight. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son, sorry, into the world, that we might live through who? Through him. I want you to notice what the text is saying to us tonight. It says that we could have life, that we could have eternity because of him. Do you see that? That we live through him. And so when you look at the text, one of the predictions, we didn't share this the other night, but 700 years before Christ, Isaiah the prophet mentions that, that Jesus would be born and another name for Jesus, his name would be Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. And I find that fascinating tonight. And so, let's see. What's so important about the gospel is that not only did God uh, love us and he came to this world, but he actually became one of us. I want you to notice what this text says to us tonight. John continues on in one of his letters in the New Testament. He says tonight, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that so the text says that he loved us and sent his son to be the... Well, that was a difficult word, wasn't it? We don't use that word too often in our common vernacular day. But I want you to notice something. This is important. It's not that God, we love God, but that God actually loves us. My friend, tonight, if you're sitting here tonight and you have had, had misconceptions about God, you grew up in a house that perhaps ridiculed God, you had parents that uh, destroyed the faith in the Bible, I want you to know tonight that when you look at the Bible, it tells us something fascinating, that we, God didn't wait for us to love Him. The text tells us that God actually loved us. Isn't that powerful? And the text tells us tonight that he sent his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation. Now the question I want to ask tonight is, what does that word propitiation mean? Well, to answer that question, we need to go all the way back to the land of Petra there in the Jordan. And as you go through to Petra, you'll notice some uh, fascinating things. In fact, Petra is situated before between the border of Israel there and it just by the, near the Dead Sea, Dead sea sorry, just a little further down here in Petra. Anyone been to Petra, by the way? Okay, brother here in the middle. Wow, fascinating, wonderful. And my dear friend down at the front row. Fascinating place, isn't it? Well, when you go to Petra, you'll notice some amazing things about this place. You'll notice that you start walking through what they call wadis or cliffs, these clefts between the rocks. And you start your journey, you walk somewhat of a K or two, and you're walking down these between these beautiful uh, cliffs. 
And what you notice that some of these cliff faces go up to about 100 meters high. And so you find yourself walking and you're there for about a good half an hour. So you're walking through. And what, tends, what happens is after you walk through, you begin to see right at there at the end of the, the valleyway there, you see this building begin to emerge. And what is so fascinating about this building is that it opens up, sorry, to what we call the El Kazna or the treasury. This is a, f- a fascinating building that was carved out of the rock. Isn't that fascinating? It's a tremendous sight to behold. And as you go there, you'll notice that as you walk through the, uh, the valley there, Petra, uh, just go back there just a second, you'll notice as you're walking your way through, you'll find these tombs over here on the left-hand side, all dotted throughout the landscape as you're walking through. Also, you see there houses that have been carved out of the rocks. In fact, the historians tell us that the Nabataeans lived here. The Nabataean Arabians lived there around 3 to 4 century B.C., And some even suggest that when you look at the Edomites in the biblical record, this is where they lived. The descendants of Esau. You know the early story in the Bible. They suggest that this is where he would have lived with his descendants. But what's fascinating, the reason I want to share these pictures with you, is that you also go and you see this famous temple carved out of the rock. Just to give you an idea of how big this place is, there's a guy there trying to walk through the front door. This little dot there. Fascinating. But what I really want to show you tonight is when you walk up the side of these, the steps that on the top of this temple, you will find something amazing when you reach to the top. When you reach to the top, you'll find this. You'll find this open area. And why did they come here? What was so significant about this place? Well, historians and scholars suggest that this is where the ancient pagans would sacrifice their children. And they would do human sacrifices right at the top there. And so the the scholars are saying to us that when the morning sun rose over the day, that they would sacrifice their children and sacrifice uh, uh, people on these somewhat altars, so to speak. And in fact, if you see this little receptacle here, they suggest, scholars say, that this is where they put the heart, a pulsating heart, almost as an offering to their pagan gods. It's quite disturbing, isn't it? But this is, this is the mindset of the pagans back in those days. In fact, this idea of propitiation, sacrifice, was not just something that the Nabataeans did. When you go to the ancient civilizations of the Mayans, you'll notice that they practice human sacrifices as well. In fact, when you go to India, some, you will notice that you go to this place. Now, let's see if I can pronounce this right. The Teotihuacan. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Forgive me for my Indian-speaking people. But you'll notice there that that, uh, scholars have discovered that the remains of many thousands of bones where they sacrificed people here. In fact, at the bottom over here, at the bottom of the Pyramid of the Sun, archaeologists, they have discovered thousands and thousands of bones which would uh, suggest that human sacrifices took place in these parts of the world. And so when you continue along, you'll notice that um, they suggest that the reconstruct, reconsecration of the Great Pyramid here, this is just an architectural model here, that um, they suggest that over, sorry, over 84,000 uh, people were human sacrifices were there in, the, in a space of about four days. Now, some would say that's an exaggeration of statistics, but the big point tonight is that sacrifices, human sacrifices actually occurred in these nations. You also go there to the Incas in Peru and you'll find at the bottom of the base of this mountain here, they're suggesting that they uncovered a lot of bones there, suggesting that even the Incas uh, also practiced the idea of human sacrifices. But I want you to notice that. I'm saying all that to say this. When you look at the the pagan mindset of centuries gone by, there are some things that you need to uh, recognize this evening. The first one is in the pagan idea of propitiation, that the first idea is that these sacrifices is to appease an angry God. Do you get that? That's why the Nabataeans would sacrifice on the top of the mountain. It's this idea that God is angry up in heaven and he's looking down and, and he needs to be comforted. So they gave their sacrifices. That's the first point. The next point is the idea of propitiation was that it was meant to remove a person's sin or a person's guilt. 
That's the idea of this uh, propitiation. And the thirdly, the idea behind it, is it will be an idea of reconciling two parties. This idea that God is over here and fallen humanity is here. And so the propitiation or the sacrifice was to merge the two parties back together. That's the idea. But I want you to notice something so amazing about the Christian faith. When you look at the Christian idea of propitiation, the Bible tends, Paul actually took this idea of propitiation and, and he flipped it. And he actually and used the idea, but it's something rather different. You see, in God's system of propitiation, it is actually God himself that brings the sacrifice. Do you see that? All through history, it is humanity bringing the sacrifice. Yet in the biblical record, it is God. God who brings the sacrifice. Not only that it is God who brings the sacrifice, but it is actually God who was the sacrifice. I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying tonight. This, this is totally flipping the idea of propitiation on its head. In, in ancient times, it was human beings bringing something to God. In the Bible account, it is God who brings the, the sacrifice. Powerful stuff. And not only that, what is the reason? The reason is, because the biblical record tells us tonight that we have been estranged from God. But what does God do? He doesn't wait for us to come to him. No, he actually comes to us. That is what is special about the Christian faith is that God becomes the sacrifice. He doesn't just send somebody else. He becomes the sacrifice. And the reason is to reconcile us back to himself. So when we look at the book of Revelation, I want you to notice how it describes this beautiful thing of, of God's sacrifice for us. Notice what the last book of the Bible tells us tonight. It tells us this evening, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. I want you to notice what the text is telling us tonight. When you look at the idea of propitiation, you look at the idea of sacrifice, what it is telling each of us tonight, my friends, is that you and I have been redeemed. Redeemed is when God buys something back that already was His. You see the idea? He's buying something that was already his. You and I, my friends, have been created by an awesome loving God. But because of sin, because of the evil in this world, it separated us. So what does God do? He steps into human history and he redeems us back. How does he do it? By his own death. By his own sacrifice. My friends, I can't begin to explain it, but I'm simply saying to you what the Bible is saying. You can take it home, you can study it, but my friends, when you understand the light of the truth of the gospel, that God actually came to this dirty, sin-stricken world, and he lived amongst us, not only he lived, but he died. More important than that, that he rose again. I want you to know tonight, friends, whether you claim to be a believer or not, I don't know what's brought you here tonight, whether you're young or old, whatever journey you want, I want you to know something. God values you. We live in a culture today where young people grow up and they don't know who they are. We live in a world where people have so much anxiety and depression. I believe it comes from the fact that they don't know who they are. And when you look at the Bible record, it tells us that we have been created by an awesome God. And God loves each of you so much that he came to this world to reconcile you Back to himself. That's the beauty of the gospel tonight, my friends. You see, at the cost of death itself, God paid the ultimate price. He sent his only son. That, my friends, is the beauty of what we're sharing tonight. Is that Jesus Christ came to this world and he voluntarily gave his life. I know that for some of you tonight, you're believers and that's fine. There's someone sitting here tonight. This is perhaps a light bulb moment. When you're sitting here this evening and you realize that the God of heaven actually loves me so much that he gave his son at the very cost of death of God in the human flesh. I've got to keep going. God values us more than his own life. This is the message that is going to the whole world before Jesus comes. I want to just point out two things uh, 
when we're talking about this idea of the gospel, which is very important that I would just like to share at this moment. It says, sin leads to death. You know, scientists can explain why we die. Scientists can explain the, the process of why we stop breathing. I'll give you a biblical record. The Bible says, because we are sinners. Not only does sin lead to death, but on the other side of the coin, righteousness leads to eternity. And this, my friends, is what the Phoenicians were looking for for so long. It's found right here. Listen to what the text tells us. Book of Romans. Romans was written by Paul. He was an apostle and he went to Rome and he told them what I'm sharing with you tonight. Listen to what he says. As sin reigned in death, even so might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to notice what Paul is saying tonight. He says that because we're sinners, there is only one, one way for us. That's death. There's no other way around it. But the Bible tells us that righteousness, in other words, living with God, holiness, comes righteousness to eternal life is through a person, through Jesus. And so, friends, when we look at the cross, Jesus' death, I'd like to submit to you this evening that there was a great exchange that took place. Great exchange. What is that exchange talking about, William? Well, it tells us here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Say the highlighted words with me, will you? It says here tonight, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for who? Us. For us, that we. we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let me just pause. This is amazing if you really think about it tonight. It's telling us that he who was perfect, Jesus, perfect sacrifice, did nothing wrong. He could look at the law of God. He could look God in the eye and says, I've done nothing wrong. He became sin for you, became sin for me. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So tonight, when we're talking about the gospel. When Jesus went to that cross, my friends, he went there not because he was a sinner. He went there because he went there to pay the death the penalty that you deserve, that you earned. And he went to that cross. So when we, when we look at Jesus, he took our sins, my sin, William's sin, everything I've done wrong, everything I've done wrong, he took that upon himself. He took it to the cross. And in exchange, Jesus says, my perfect life, my righteousness, the life, William, that you should have lived, the life that you should have lived, I now give it to you. That's why at the cross there is a great exchange. God takes our sin, our guilt, and he takes it upon himself and he gives us his perfect righteousness. That's why at the cross, my friends, there is a great exchange. Our sin taken by him causes his death and his righteousness counted to us gives us eternal life. So the question as we go to the last section of our presentation for part one, what do we have to do? How do we take, how do we take uh, advantage of this great gift that God gives us? Well, it's very simple tonight, friends, and it's our third point tonight. I don't know if you can see it there. It says the gospel of God's grace is free. It's free. I want you to notice before. When you go to over Turkey there, one of the largest archaeological sites in the world today that has been preserved is the city of Ephesus. What we now call modern-day Turkey. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. You'll notice there the library of Celsus on, my, on the right side there. But on the left side is this famous amphitheater. And you can see there in the background there's this colonnade, kind of a pathway that leads into the city. And back in the days of the Apostle Paul, this city, Ephesus, worshipped the pagan goddess Artemis or Diana. You read about it in the New Testament scripture. She was a goddess of fertility. You know the idea of Easter eggs today and all the millions and millions... If you trace its origin back, it goes back to Artemis and the fertility goddess. Paul came into this city one day and what they did there in the amphitheater, they, Paul came in here and started preaching about Jesus, about the gospel, what I'm sharing to you tonight. So you know what the, the townsfolk in Ephesus did? 
Well, they got all the silversmiths, those who were making all these pagan little idols to Artemis and Diana because they were getting out of business because Paul was preaching Jesus. So they, they cause a, a frenzy in this amphitheater and for two hours they're shouting, Great is Diana! Great is Diana! Great is Diana! They were causing a, a storm, a ruckus there. The reason why is because when Paul came into this city, he told them these words. He tells them, For by grace, grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I want you to notice something so special tonight about the gospel, my friends. You cannot earn the gospel. You cannot earn your way to heaven. Isn't that good news? Because if it was up to us, we'd all fail. The gospel, my friends, tonight is free to everyone here this evening if you're so willing to take hold of it. And just like a gift, a gift is something you don't earn. A gift is something you simply Except, now all of us have received gifts in our lives, whether it's birthdays or a good friend of us, a thought of us and gave us a gift. How does it make you feel? Make you feel special, right? Feel good about yourself, that someone was thinking about me. You didn't earn that gift. What did you do? You simply received it. And I want to tell you tonight, friends, that the gospel of Jesus, this first angel's message that goes to the whole world, is a gift. A gift, my friends, is free. But if I could just interject here, it also costs something. It cost Jesus his life. You can't buy or you can't earn it. That is what's so tremendous about what I'm sharing to you tonight. When you're asking yourself the question, how would William, how can I have eternal life? Do I need to build a big pyramid? Do I need to have all of these artifacts around me? No. The biblical text tells us tonight, you simply believe and put your faith in the one who died for you. My friends, that gift is absolutely free. And you can have that tonight if you so desire. I want you to notice what it tells us in the book of Galatians. In chapter 2, can you say those words with me? A man is not justified. justified. What does justified mean? It simply means to be made right with God. Man is not justified by the works of the law. What's the law? Human obedience to God's law. We're going to talk about that part too. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in other words no flesh it's saying there is nothing you can do to earn eternal life yeah we clear on that that's what the text is saying there's nothing i can do there's nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven it's a gift you have to simply accept it that's why it says for by the works of the law there was no one to be justified. When you and I spend eternity with Jesus in heaven, we can't look at ourselves and go, Oh man, Will, you really did a lot down there. Good on you, Will. No, we're all there because of the blood of Jesus. And that's good news tonight. You see, my friends, it's the truth of the spotted leopard. Now, what do I mean by that? An Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah said these words, and they ring so true tonight. He said these words, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can he? No. Or can the leopard change its spots? Then Jeremiah goes on to say, Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Now I want you to notice what uh, Jeremiah is saying. He's essentially saying tonight, you can't change yourself. You know, I remember when I was just in my early 20s and I was trying to struggling. I, I had a bit of a marijuana addiction and I used to smoke weed almost every second day. And I remember I would gather around with all the boys in Sydney, right? All the Tongan boys and we'd all be drinking and partying and smoking. And something dawned in me that I didn't like what I was doing. And I used to remember, I used to say to them, all my boys, I used to say to them, boys, this is my last smoke. It's my last chuff. We call it chuff in Sydney. My last chuff. I'm not doing this anymore. And I used to repeat this almost every week, almost without fail. And you know what one of the boys said to me? I still remember it as clear as day. He looked me right in the eye in front of all the boys amidst all the haze and the smoke. And he said to me, Will, why do you keep saying that, brother? He said, you will never change. And you know what? I, I tried to, I tried to change. I tried to change. I say, no, no, I'm going to stop it. You watch, you watch. And maybe a week or two, but sure enough, I was back there with the boys. 
Friends, can I just share with you a personal testimony? When I left, school, when I left uh, high school back in 99 and I was hanging around with the boys, uh, I became involved in, in, in a group of boys in Sydney that got up to criminal activities. I don't want to go into that, but I lived a dark life. Now, I can vividly remember after coming home from all of these weekend benders with the boys, and I remember I used to just lock the door and I used to go and lie on the back of my bed. And I don't know if about you, but if you've been exposed to music for so many days that when you go home, that your, your ears are deafening, it's kind of reverberating. And I can remember like yesterday that I would literally just be on my bed and I'd be weeping and I'd be crying. You know what I'd be saying? I'd be saying, help me, Lord. But here's the funny thing. I didn't really claim to know God. But I knew that something was wrong with me. I remember I weep on my bed. I say, Lord, please help me. Please help me. I I don't want to share to you tonight things that I've done. I'm not proud of things that I've did. And I look back on my past and I said, that was the man I was. But you know, my friends, when I met Jesus, he gave me the power to live a new life. And I stand before you tonight as a, as a witness, if I could put it this way, of what happens when someone gives their life to God. I can say to you that I can walk past a nightclub, I can walk past a bar, there's no inkling in me to drink, and I can only put it down, my friends, to the power of God. He can change your life, and He wants to, because He wants to live with you for eternity. And so when I remember reading this for the first time in a Bible study, I'm like, that's me right there. That's, God's talking to me. I can't change myself. But I, all I could do is throw myself at the foot of the cross, say, Lord, help me. And he did that for me, friends. And that's why I'm here tonight. I came all the way from Australia to tell you, brother, to tell you God loves you. And he wants you in his kingdom. That's what God wants for you tonight. You can't save yourself Eternally, that's what Jeremiah says. Will, you can't change yourself. You can simply acknowledge, I need help. And there's someone that can change me. Okay, how to receive it. Friends, there's just a couple of points before we wrap this up tonight. Number one, we must believe in Christ. John chapter 3, perhaps the most famous Bible verse in all of Scripture, says, whoever Believe. believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Another word for belief is to simply trust. That's right. We trust in what Jesus has done for us. You see, to fly is to trust. I flew over here from Australia and I landed. You know, I got in my plane. I didn't worry about who was at the front seat, who was flying this big plane. I just got there and put the headphones on. You know how you do it when you go onto the plane and you watch the ladies do all their you know, their procedures before we fly off. Not once did I sit in my seat and go, hmm, I wonder if this plane's going to make it. I wonder, does he, did he qualify? Which school did he go to? Do we think that when we're sitting in the plane? No. But there's an element of trust that someone that's flying his plane can get me to New Zealand. I want you to put that same faith in Jesus. I can't explain how a man 2,000 years ago died on a cross and how his blood can save me tonight. I can't explain that to you. I can't explain how a black cow can eat green grass, produce yellow butter and white milk. I can't explain that to you, but I believe it. We've got to put our trust in him. Some of you know the great uh, adventurer. His name was Blondin. And um, Blondin was known for his dangerous uh, stunts. And they say that he went on tightrope. He walked across the great Niagara Falls. Some of you may know this story. The story says that when Blondin, uh, when he went over the, the rope one day from around the Niagara Falls, that he looked at the crowd that was watching him in anticipation. And he, he, he threw out the question to everyone there, tonight, today, there that day. How many of you believe that I can walk across this tightrope with someone on my shoulders? And then everyone said, like, yeah, you can do it, you can do it. And guess what his next question was? Who's the first volunteer? <laughs> no one put their hand up. You know... We need to put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. Number two, we must repent of sin. I just want to talk about repentance for a moment. Uh, The biblical record tells us in the book of Mark, it says, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. Remember we said that the other night. The 70-week prophecy of Daniel. Jesus the Messiah came on time. So he walks on the planet Earth. What does he say? Guess what, guys? Time is almost up. Jesus understood prophecy. 
said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And what does Jesus say next? Repent. What does the word repent mean? Simply means a change of mind. It means this is the way I was walking. This is the way I thought. This is the way I thought about God. This is the way I thought about life. This is the way I thought about myself. And now when I've decided to follow Jesus, I now turn around and I'm walking a different way. Change of mind. Also means to choose to turn away from sin and go in a new direction. That's what God wants to do in our lives. And that's what he wants to do with us tonight. The question is why? Why does God want to do this? Well, there's a very sobering text in the Bible and I want to share it with you tonight. I don't want to hold anything back. I want you to know everything, all right? This is what the text tells us in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now you might sit there and read that tonight and go, wow, what a really harsh God. But when you really look at the biblical principles of why he's saying these words, because God is a God of love. And he wants us to be in a kingdom with him where love reigns. And if you come to part two in a few moments, we're going to talk about God's great principles of love. So why do we share this text? Because God says, if we don't repent and change our lives, we can't be fit for the kingdom. In fact, I'll put it to you this way. Hypothetically speaking, if you, God transported you to heaven right now with your desires and your carnal nature and the way you think and act and talk, the things you love in this world, you wouldn't like it in heaven. Because in heaven, it's different. It's an atmosphere of peace and love and joy. You wouldn't like it. God says to us, those who practice such things, God loves all sinners. Do you hear what I'm saying? God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. There's a big difference. Okay. We have to repent and believe. These things I've written to you. This is John speaking. He says, I've written these things to you that you, can you say it with me? You may know that you have eternal life if you were to you were to sit here, if John was sitting here with you tonight, and he said, John, why did you write the gospel of John? He said, I'm writing it to you so that you know that you have eternal life. That's his purpose statement why he wrote his story for us tonight. See, friends, as we close this evening, we're presented with a gulf, and there's two sides between the, the valley. On one side, there is eternal death. On the other side, there is eternal life. And the Phoenicians centuries ago were asking the question, how do we get eternal life? How can I be forever young? How can I live for eternity? I want to tell you tonight, friends, there is one person that can get us there. And his name is Jesus. One of his disciples asked him in the gospel, how do we know the way when he told them he was going back to heaven? Some of you know the story. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. My friends, tonight... I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to tonight. I want to just close a couple of verses. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. 1 John chapter 5. This is the same disciple. Listen to what John says. He says, God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Who's that? Jesus. He who has the son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. My question to you tonight, friends, is do you have the Son? Is Jesus in your life? Have you accepted the free gift of Jesus in your life? How do you have Christ? We close with this text here. Revelation chapter 3. I love this verse of Scripture. I want you to hear what God says to you tonight. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and... Knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. It's very simple tonight, friends. Jesus says, if you want him to come into your life, you have to invite him in. You simply say, Lord, Jesus, come into my heart. I invite you into my heart. You see, notice the Bible. God knocks. He doesn't force his way in. 
We have to allow him in. And if you will do that tonight, something precious will happen in your life. You can be guaranteed that if anything would happen to you from this moment forward, if God forbid that something should happen on your way home tonight, you will know that you have eternal life. And that, my friends, is the gospel that's going to the whole world. And God wants you here tonight to know that. The good news tonight is that God wants to be in your life and in your heart. And friends, I, I, I'm going to share a little bit about my story as we continue on in, our, in the next coming programs. But I want you to know tonight that I'm no different from you. I'm just a, a, a human being like you. I'm a sinner like you. But I've accepted Jesus. And it's been a wonderful journey. I've been serving the Lord for 13 years now. I gave my life to God when I was in 2014. And I, I gave my life as a young 24-year-old in Sydney, in Concord, in Inner West. And if I could tell you that from that moment to now, that God would, would open so many doors and allow me to do what I'm doing, I could look you right in the face back in those days and say, Bro, you got the wrong brother. It's not me. Do you know, God has an amazing plan for each of our lives. I want you to know that. That God has a plan for your life. And so at this moment, we're going to ask you to respond to tonight's message. And what I have for you this evening, we're going to do this in the last few minutes before we break, is that we're going to have a card that's going to go out. And what this card is going to do is actually it's going to invite you to respond to the meetings that uh, what I've just said tonight. And so I've got a few people that's going to hand you a card tonight. And we're going to do this for a few minutes. And the card just has simply three questions on it. Okay? Number one, I turn from my sins and accept Jesus as my Savior and master of my life. If you've never accepted Jesus tonight, and you'd like to say as you sit here, I want to accept Jesus. I want to follow him. I want you to circle number one. If you have already have a relationship with Jesus and you want to cement that decision tonight, or in other words, recommit, I'd like you to circle number two. And number three, if you'd like a free copy, please circle number three. You will love this book. And it's not a big book, it's not a gigantic book, it's only a small paperback. It's wonderful counsel on following Jesus. And we'd love to give that to you as a gift from us to you, to help you in your journey. Okay? Come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now, the script was used to take the journey of a lifetime ages. and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program.